Hi everyone, uh, welcome to November and welcome to our next tutorial. This one's on DNA and this one is actually uh, going to come close to wrapping up. I think this does wrap up this particular unit uh, on biological evidence. Um, and so after this you've got a unit test to take and then we start a whole new unit. Plus another thing I want to remind you is is that we're sneaking up on the end of the nine weeks. Um, November is a very short month. I mean, it's, it's 30 days, but we get a week out of that for Thanksgiving break. So it's only three weeks in November and only about two weeks in December, and then we're done. So we're sitting on five weeks away from finishing out this nine weeks and this semester. And so you guys are going to need to start focusing on getting caught up. All right. So we're going to start here with a DNA tutorial. Let's take a look at the um, objective. In this lesson, you're going to explain laboratory procedures used to analyze deoxyribonucleic acid. Great big word. Deoxyribonucleic acid. I want to just go ahead and cover something in here. There's another thing called ribonucleic acid. Uh, you've probably heard of RNA. Okay. Now, then take a look at the prefix for DNA. Deoxy. Anybody want to stop and think about why? what's different between DNA and RNA? What do you think oxy refers to? Okay, then what do you think to deoxy something means, right? So guess what the primary difference between RNA and DNA is, molecularly speaking? Yep, that's right. DNA is missing something that RNA has. All right, let's keep going. So in forensic science, there is a lot having to do with DNA. DNA for forensic science was like the, the best thing to ever happen because, and we're talking like in the last... Well, since roughly 1990, we've been able to really examine DNA and be able to match people's DNA uh, with them. Prior to that, if you left DNA at a crime scene, it wasn't necessarily something that could point to you. But now, DNA can actually point directly to an individual. And there have been so many laws created around this type of sampling uh, to the point where um, there are legal teams who specialize in this kind of defense, for example. Do you have the right to subpoena my DNA, my genetic profile? Questions like that are being asked today. Of course, one of the most famous was O.J. Simpson's uh, trial in which there was some DNA evidence attempted to use in O.J.'s trial, and it did not work out. But um, uh, the DNA evidence was very compelling in that trial, and that was one of the first times that we started hearing about this idea of DNA evidence being used in a criminal trial. So we're going to talk about DNA, <clears throat> and this is going to sound more like science class, biology class, than forensic science this week, but this hopefully will be a review for you because we're going to talk about the structure of DNA, we're going to talk about how it pairs together to create uh, a, a very specific structure and how that's used for fingerprinting. We're also going to be describe the extraction of DNA and preserving it, how we, how we do that to make sure that we can get it from a crime scene to a lab. And then we're going to talk about this stuff called PCR or polymerase chain reaction. And we're going to talk about how that's used for DNA typing because that's a, that right there, that PCR, when that was, when we first figured out how to do that, man, that changed, that was one of those milestones in forensics and in DNA. So let's talk about DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. We shorten that to the D, the N right there, and then the A for acid. And this is this has often been called the building blocks of life, and for very good reason. Each one of these little lines right here represents two nitrogenous bases that attach to each other. On one side, you got a base right here that's just starting right there and going over here, and then part of this, that's all a base. And then right here, you got another one that comes over here, and that's part of this base, and they stick together. <coughs> In fact, we have some rules. The G, which is a nitrogenous base, if there's a G over here, and I don't, that's the purple one, so that's a G, it'll always bond with a C, which is this guy here, a cytosine, every time. If you've got a G on one side, you got a C on the other. If you've got an adenine on one side, that's an A, then you got a thymine on the other side. Now this is this is the way that it works. Okay, uh, can that get screwed up? Absolutely. Sometimes we accidentally have um, a different ones get stuck in here, and that's what's called a mutation. That's a whole nother discussion. Okay, uh, I'll tell you really fast. Notice that adenine and guanine have two rings. That makes them what we call purines. Okay, and sometimes when there's supposed to be an adenine there, 
sometimes a guanine gets put in there by accident and then the other side shifts to and next thing you know you got a screwed up code but see this code so this goes G what is that that's an A then a, a, a C then a T that code is just like we were trying to type a code into a computer if you want to program a computer you just type in lines of code and it does what it's supposed to do well your body is the same way and everybody's code is very different but every single living thing on earth from humans all the way down to the most basic of bacteria uses this code to design us to program us this the code on this DNA is used to make proteins and proteins build our bodies they're like the cement blocks that build our bodies and the differences between you and I the difference between you and a rhinoceros the difference between you and a bacteria are what are the different proteins that make you up and the information to make those proteins comes from this the strand of DNA you and I have a very different it's very similar but there's pieces of it that are different that's why you and I are different we're not genetically identical okay now unless you have a twin you, there's no other organism on earth that has ever lived or ever will live that has the same combination of DNA that you do which makes you very unique okay DNA is hereditary model material found in all organisms it lives it's inside it's found inside of the nucleus um, and every cell in your body except red blood cells has that DNA inside of it the reason your red blood cells don't have it is because they um, they disappear they, they don't live very long and so they do a lot of work and they move fast so they actually don't want to carry around that heavy DNA so they have DNA then they get rid of it and then they go do their job then they die and we make more right um, however even on blood cells that don't have DNA we still find pieces of DNA inside of a structure called a mitochondria that's a whole nother argument okay I've already explained all this to you so we're just gonna move on Here's another look. By the way, these are artistic drawings. It really does not look this way, but this is drawn this way to help you kind of understand what we're trying to, what what we see. It's not, um, uh, it's not uh, an easy thing to look at in a real structure. First of all, it's very small. It's hard to see under a microscope. When you do, you really can't tell much. So we build a model for the way that it looks. But as we talked about the structure of DNA it's two-sided see how one side is blue and one side is green imagine if you could untwist that and make it look more like a ladder one side would be blue one side would be green that's actually DNA is two pieces stuck together like a zipper you know how you got a zipper and you got two sides and when you zip it up they're really stuck together well DNA is kinda like that and right here in the middle between that uh, yellow or what would you call it orange and green that's a that's a, a separation in between the purple and the blue that's a separation of the two sides you see how it says C from that spot right there all the way over and then about you know and then a portion of this this is called the backbone that is a nucleotide and that happens to be cytosine it always bonds like I said earlier it always bonds with a G on the other side so the G starts here goes all the way over here that's a piece of the G and then some of this backbone is the G that is guanine so cytosine and guanine go together and they create a rung in the ladder and you keep going and there's another rung there where some adenine and thymine bonds together and you keep going there's another rung and another rung and all the way up this creates now I don't want you to think you see they kind of alternate it here and I hate it when they do that but it's not just one after the other it goes CG and then TA and then CG and it doesn't do that it's not random either but it, it goes into an order okay uh, A's G's C's and T's and so it could be G G G G G G G C T A C T G T T T T C it's random it would look random even though it's not it's very specific but you know there's three billion of these little pairs three billion if you were to look at one per second it would take you 72 years if you did it non-stop that's no bathroom breaks breaks no sleeping or anything it is huge and there's a huge amount of information there but that's what it takes to to create our bodies it takes it creates all the information that uh, our bodies need to uh, function okay uh, and to build and to build the proteins that make us proteins build our bodies and they're also involved in regulating and controlling our bodies and just about every function or structure that you have in your body is built around proteins it's not all proteins but a lot of it is proteins right and these tell us how to build those proteins and what to do with them so this is really important stuff <coughs> excuse me um, 
each nucleotide this is that's just like the little green guy here this adenine that's a nucleotide it's got two parts it's got a phosphate group that's gonna be um, right here this chemical base is part of it right here's the phosphate group this is the chemical base and on the back side is a sugar believe it or not called deoxyribose so we got some deoxyribose there and some phosphate there and then the base right there that's called the base that's why these are called base pairs because there's two base pairs stuck together all right and so technically there's six billion of these bases but since they're put together in pairs there's three billion pairs okay and it resembles a ladder and you you know we've already talked about all that so let's go on so now we're going to talk about the relationship between dna and chromosomes okay dna is very small um and in the uh, calendar this week there's a link to a video that shows you how this dna in the right part in the right time can coil up and to create chromosomes okay now this is it doesn't happen most of the time the chromosomes are not present in a cell it's only when they're getting ready to divide so if you were to look at a bunch of cells under the microscope you wouldn't see this very often okay but you can find it and that's when we see these chromosomes but normally these aren't present this is DNA all packed up a chromosome is it's packed up getting ready to move but we don't want to leave it packed up in fact we don't want to pack it up any longer than we have to because when it's packed up we can't use it so it normally stays unpacked and kind of I call it fluffed out it kind of looks like cotton okay but then the genes are open and available but these are the genes this is the DNA and actually this is the DNA and a little piece of DNA that makes one protein that's called a gene and they all get packed up into these chromosomal shapes okay now we were able to see these chromosomes in a microscope and one of the first ways that we we're able to do some genetic testing on people is by just comparing their chromosomes by looking at the chromosomes we can look at the chromosomes under a microscope and a little bit of stain and we can see some patterns there and well back into the 40s and 50s we were able to do that and it was somewhat consistent you could kind of do some paternity testing and sort of thing okay uh, only later did we were we able to actually look at the DNA because the DNA I mean chromosomes are small you have to have a microscope to see them and this isn't even a scale can you imagine how small DNA is all right now look all humans have 23 sets of chromosomes and and, and we're gonna say pairs but I want you to understand something 23 pairs of chromosomes in each pair now they're not connected like a pair of pants right but in each pair like you got a pair of salt and pepper shakers or something right in each pair one comes from the mom and one comes from the dad so you have 23 pairs of chromosomes 46 total 23 of those came from your mom and you got like a mirror set that came from your dad 23 okay that's why we have things like 23 and me um, and when we have uh, you, you know like you've heard of that that's the that's the DNA testing thing um, 23 and me takes and tests your DNA because it looks at 23 chromosomes and all humans every human has 23 chromosomes unless you have an unfortunate situation like you have some type of um, disease called trisomy or it's it's called um, um, down syndrome if you have down syndrome then you have an extra chromosome but other than that all humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes so as complex as it is three billion pairs it would take a computer up until very recently with things like 23andMe it would have taken a computer hours days to to look at all of the genetic information today we've gotten better at it so this information that we're looking at here is just a little bit outdated when I say a little bit I'm talking like a year or two okay it used to be that we didn't look at every single thing on the DNA we looked for patterns and the patterns that we found in DNA were, were similar uh, they're unique all right so um, this idea of DNA fingerprinting is instead of looking at the actual DNA we look for patterns in the DNA and you can find this DNA in hair blood saliva semen it's all there right um, we look for patterns in the DNA and then we compare those patterns of the sample versus uh, the a suspect and then we can say with a lot of confidence um, that this this sample DNA sample belongs to this suspect which then puts that suspect at the scene of the crime today we're getting even better today we're getting to the point where we can look at actual individual genes and um, be able to compare and say yeah this it gives us a more accurate okay but um, DNA fingerprinting has been very useful and it is honored by the courts uh, in the right hands with the right technician uh, it's pretty 
pretty lock solid. You're not going to have a problem with a defense attorney arguing about DNA evidence. It's considered to be pretty much, you know, locked in. So one of the more difficult things we have to do at a crime scene is to take some of this DNA that could be minutes or hours old, more than likely hours, but it could be days old. It could even be, and this is crazy for me to think about, but it could even be years old. You know, you go back to a crime scene from like on a cold case and you try to find some more evidence and well, sure enough, there's a, a piece of bone or a tooth or even some hair that um, we can then go and collect the sample for and see if we can get some DNA out of it. But most crime scenes, the, the DNA evidence is just hours old, but collecting it in a way that it can be sent off to a lab is something that requires some care. And of course, we've got lots of experience at it, so we we know what to do. And, you know, we need to keep it in a you know, kind of moist and in a container to keep it from getting contaminated by other stuff. We're going to be looking at things like blood, obviously, hair, teeth, bones, semen, vaginal fluid, and even fingerprints. Fingerprints can actually leave some DNA, depending on it. It's not common, but it can happen that fingerprints can leave some DNA. And, um, we can then take all that information and a, and a talented crime scene investigator can take all that information, collect it in a way that keeps it viable, put it into sample containers and ship it to a lab where they can draw, um, they can get uh, a, a match, which then gives the prosecutor more of a case. So the goal of collecting this evidence means that you not only have to get it from, uh, you know, whatever you're looking at, a shirt, a pocket knife, a door handle, the corner of the room, you know, wherever this stuff may land, you have to be able to find it and get it out of there, but you also have to keep it from being contaminated with other types of DNA or other types of chemical sources or biological sources. And so, I mean, this may sound kind of funny, but forensic scientists got to take care not to touch, sneeze or cough into the DNA evidence because then you've added your DNA to it and it can really cause problems and maybe even totally invalidate the sample. You should use latex gloves so that the, you know, tissues from your hands don't get into it. You should put them in paper bags instead of plastic bags um, because plastic bags keep moisture and the moisture can damage the DNA. So we put it in a paper bag um, so that it can be um, preserved better and, the, and moisture doesn't build up and cause damage to the DNA. Semen stains and blood stains have to be air dried before they go into the paper bag. I, that's crazy. I, I would have thought it was the opposite, but guess what we all learned today. In the case of the dry sample, you moisten a cotton swab with distilled water, then you rub it onto the sample, uh, and so now the swab has got some of the sample on it, whether it's semen or blood or even saliva, and then you put it, you allow it to air dry, so you let it sit out and dry, and then you put it into the paper bag, and then it stays dry. DNA is susceptible to damage in warm conditions, so guess what? We put it into a refrigerator or a freezer, and then we even, even when we ship it, it's shipped cold, like in a cold pack, until it gets to um, the laboratory if you have to ship it you know any kind of distance like I said some counties have their own forensics lab Okeechobee County can't afford one so we just have crime scene techs that then send our uh, they do some but we send a lot of our stuff out to a lab somewhere out of the county and it has to be shipped in a in a way that keeps the um, the samples from getting damaged and before it gets to the lab so a lot of times that includes boxing it up in a cooler or some other kind of cold pack or driving it there yourself in a cooler you know now once it gets to the actual crimes lab there we have to do some things like with the DNA there's more in a sample of blood usually than just the DNA there's some other things specifically some of these cellular proteins and they can start to actually break down the DNA so the first thing you want to do and it also causes problems with the the sampling procedure with the chemicals they use so the first thing you're going to want to do is remove all those things and just kind of get down to just the DNA you can do this with physical or chemical means that includes like grinding and blending um, these these all cells so you know DNA is found inside of a cell and all cells have like a, a lipid layer around them it's like um, if you think of a water balloon the actual balloon skin on cells is made out of lipids and lipids are fats so we use this detergent such as this word I'm not even gonna try it SDS uh, to remove the lipids layer first and that kind of exposes the DNA then we use some other enzymes that, that, that attack the proteins and this sodium acetate and this phenol chloroform mixture and it, and it gets all these cellular proteins out of the way. Then we put it into a centrifuge and it kind of separates it out in a test tube. All right. And so a lot of the heavy stuff goes to the bottom, the lighter stuff goes to the top, but somewhere there's a layer of DNA in it. 
then we stick a needle down in there to just that layer we want and we pull out what is hopefully a huge sample of DNA all right and that's what's happening here and then we transfer it we let it dry and um, then we put it into a, um, a buffer solution and we can store it or we can test it and so you got to do a lot and if you're going to be a crime scene tech which is I'm assuming part of the reason you're taking this class because you're thinking about it it's cool it's fun but it's kind of meticulous and there's a process that you're going to have to go through and you got to go learn that that's what you go to college to be a crime scene tech for is you go learn all the chemistry behind this so that when you go to a crime scene and do it you're not going to goof it up and you know let a criminal walk and uh, as a result boom you got your all these this is a crazy difficult process I wouldn't say difficult but tedious and with several steps and if you if you get it right if you can do it right then you're you're you know you're gonna be like man we got that guy because we were able to go to the crime scene and and and, and s legally isolate his DNA and present it in court um, and, and and it's a process okay so that leads us to this lesson activity now I know you guys look at this lesson activity and you're like whoa what are you talking about but listen I do this at home I did it with my daughter just the other day just to have fun with it it's not that hard all you gotta have is like some peas you just go to the store and buy a bag of peas it's 89 cents at Aldi a little bit of salt and a cup of cold water I think you need some laundry detergent and maybe some alcohol uh, isopropyl alcohol okay now that's gonna be isopropyl alcohol is like if you if you got that bottle of that, that white bottle it's 95 cents at um, uh, Walgreens if you got that white bottle uh, you know like the the nurse will rub it on you and it smells funny just for the doctor gives you a shot that's it it's isopropyl you can't drink it if you do it'll kill you but um, that's all you really need and in a blender I think and once you do that you're actually you're actually gonna be able to hang on so anyway long story short <clears throat> this is not a difficult activity to do so you need to do it okay and you need to figure out what these questions are good questions you, you need to answer them what is what did the liquid detergent do and you may have to go back a slide I explained it but go back a slide what did the liquid detergent do to the cells in the peas the meat tenderizer is an enzyme what did it do okay what did the alcohol do that's very important and what you type in here is you answer those questions those four questions have to be answered here now to be totally honest with you you don't really have to do the lab to answer those questions but the lab's cool you should do it anyways okay all right moving along okay so remember when we were talking about how we can't I mean only recently like within the last year or two are we able to really look at the DNA and prior to that we had to just look for repeating patterns so this is what we're talking about here okay 99% of the DNA sequence between me and you and any other human on earth is basically identical so the differences are hard to see okay and unless you're what they call monozygotic twins or identical twins uh, everybody's DNA is slightly different so instead of looking at all the DNA we just try to look at the differences in the DNA okay and these variations they occur as short sequences of bases only two to five base pairs but they repeat so it's like TACG 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 and it repeats over and over again and how, what what repeats and how many times it repeats uh, these are called STRs or short tandem repeats how many STRs there are and how many times they repeat it's kind of different for every person so when we what we can really do is just look for those STRs and look for the STR patterns and we do this with something called PCR or poly polymerase chain reaction and um, what they do is they amplify the STRs in like this gel so that you can see them and as a result um, it makes it it's, it's, it's like pretty clear computers do it now but you used to do it um, in class and you could uh, you could um, see the cool stuff happening right in front of you we I've done PCR in a class well, not in Okeechobee because we don't have it but I did it in a lab up in Orlando one time and you could watch it just happen it was the coolest thing pause now again here's a process to do something in PCR you have to do it in what's called a thermal cycler and this instrument's programmed to heat cool heat cool and the heating and the cooling and the heating and the cooling it starts making copies of all these STR regions and they heat and cool heat and cool heat and cool heat and cool until they become elongated okay so the first thing you have to do is what we call denature it with DNA uh, with DNA and you do that with um, some type of usually an alcohol but 
it, it, it makes the DNA a single strand. Okay, so the DNA comes apart. Then you bind these things called primers to it. You just got a big old jug of primers. And you do that when it's cold. Okay, so the primers are added to the STR regions and they um, then they get ready to be amplified. So then you heat it up again, then you cool it off again, you heat it up again. And all that happens and it's called elongation. And then finally you end it with, um, uh, you use something called tack polymerase. And anyway, long story short, and, and this is just a lot to explain, okay? But after the end of the cycle, two copies of the target DNA are obtained and then this happens millions of times and the next thing you know you got something you can read so then we put them in this gel okay and this gel is really cool because this plastic tray this gel it's I don't know it's kinda like jello really you take your your STRs that you've elongated and you put it in this needle and you inject it into these kind of little these little bitty dots in the gel okay they're like little indentations if you could zoom in they would kinda look like um, like an egg carton and you just put a little bit of gel in there and then you pass electricity through it and the electricity moves this stuff down this um, down this 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 gel and uh, the heavier stuff goes further or does the heavier stuff the lighter stuff goes further I think the lighter stuff goes further anyway you get this streak and you put your you put what you know in here this is a known sample and you put it next to an unknown sample and you let it streak and when it's done you can visually compare the streaks for the STRs and at, at the end of it you get a unique pattern per person and so if I know if I got a sample I'm like okay I, I want to see if this sample matches up to the bad guy or the suspected bad guy I put the sample in here the suspected bad guy we take some some blood from him when we put it in there and then we let it streak and if the patterns end up the same then it's just like a fingerprint you're like yeah see look it's, this is the guy we did an STR or a PCR uh, gel on the guy and we get the same pattern um, if you if you do it in, and it's not the same pattern it's pretty good evidence that this guy who isn't who owns the DNA sample it's amazing and you know you can buy this stuff on Amazon that's how that's how easy it is these days we do we've done it like crazy of course, like I said, today we could just do like a 23andMe type of analysis, but that's really new and it's not really working its way into forensic evidence yet. It will be soon. Soon this will be old school and doing like a 23andMe genetic analysis is what we'll be doing then. Okay, what do we do with this? Well, we can identify the criminals, right? We can say, okay, we got some blood from the scene. We think that guy did it. Get some of his blood. Do a PCR gel in both of them. If the patterns end up the same, then that's your guy right we can also identify corpses we've got a known sample like when you had a tooth extractor or something I don't know but we've got a known sample of a, of a person and then we got a dead corpse can we take tissue from the corpse tissue from when the corpse was alive and we know that and then we compare the two and if they weren't the same then we know the corpses is this person who owned this tooth 10 years ago uh, we can also do like family members so if there's a corpse um, like my brother and I should have a very similar PCR pattern. Won't be identical, but it'll be similar. So if you if, if I'm dead in a ditch somewhere and they can't identify the body, but they take some DNA and then they compare it to take some of my brother and they put it through a PCR gel, the 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 pattern should come out highly similar, suggesting that um, I'm the I'm the the brother, right? That they've been missing for ten years and probably haven't even been crying about it. Anyway, another one would be paternity and maternity. We can do paternity testing. Is this, is, does this baby belong to this father and this mother? And again, the same kind of a thing because of the similarity of the genes of the parents, the child, you run it through the PCR and you should be able to find a very similar pattern. And you'd be amazed how often you have to do paternity and maternity, even when we're talking about like a mother and a father who, and a child who are all happily living together and all of a sudden, for some reason, somebody says, yeah, but that's my kid. Uh, they were switched at birth of the hospital or something and there's a million reasons why this could happen so it's a very complicated thing but a very valuable effective and the most important part legally accepted way of doing DNA uh, analysis and comparison okay here's another activity you're gonna go um, you're gonna go Google the Boston Strangler case read about it and you're gonna find out how the DNA in the Boston Strangler case helped out and you're gonna write with me or write for me here um, tell me how DNA was used in you know discuss how DNA was used <clears throat> to solve the Boston Strangler case okay yeah and I expect some work here um, do some writing don't be you know 
don't be don't just say well they they collected it and then they tested it that's not you're not going to get a good grade for that you're going to get a good grade for this is if you do some writing and don't copy either because the computer tells me when you copy and that's it that wraps up the DNA tutorial uh, actually pretty quick and easy so um, don't um, you know go back and reread it on your own without listening to me make sure you're doing the notes okay and then uh, you should be all right this was not that difficult and uh, and I think you guys are gonna be good at it all right get to work